Okay, so I'm making a reading assignment. Uh, Paul Yushkovich has provided one paper on each of his two main methods. One of them was a method based on solving a partial differential equation. Uh, the other one was a method based on, on deformation with these medially connected point pairs. And I am, for those who are here uh, auditing, I recommend you look at those papers. For those who are taking the course for credit, I'm assigning the, the reading of those two papers. So we would, I'm continuing on now with this, these SREPs, which are <coughs> skeletal models discreetly sampled on the skeleton and with spokes both from the top side of the skeletal sheet, the folded skeletal sheet, and from the top bottom side and from the fold. And I talked last time <coughs> about multi-object models. Um, the point to make is that beyond the individual objects, there is a shape of the connection between the objects, the relationship of the objects. And <coughs> the general notion is that because you already have correspondence <coughs> with each of the objects, this has only been worked out for two objects so far, but it hopefully can be extended to multiple objects. You extend the spokes from each of the objects until they intersect one object and another object. You have spokes coming out of this one, various spokes. The spokes coming out of this one. When they intersect at an equal distance from their respective boundaries, you can produce a linking surface, except for the problem of crossing spokes. <coughs> the idea is that Julian Yo developed was to throw away any, any ones that were <coughs> crossing and then interpolating a smooth surface between <coughs> the, the crossing points for the ones that don't cross within the object. Within, in, and, and then you have these so-called link vectors from each boundary to the linking surface. And you can use their <laughs> lengths and, direct, and directions as, uh, as geometric features to describe the space in between them. Okay? Notice that for the ones that do cross, um, you're not using them. And so there may well be uh, one of these vectors that was not included in providing the linking surface, but nevertheless has an interpolated link to it. And those take part in the, in the statistics as well. Uh, As I said last time, um, <coughs> have I stopped screen sharing maybe? No, okay. Uh, as I said last time, <coughs> at least in this one experiment of comparing of doing statistics between six months old pairs of the, these two structures, 
the clade and, and the hippocampus, you got better classification when you included these link structures as compared to when you didn't. Now, how you, how you use a, a set of features that are object features and on the other hand, a set of features that are link features or possibly if you didn't try to do the linking, just two different objects or three or four is an interesting statistical question that we will cover in the upcoming part of the course on shape statistics. But for the time being, I'm leaving that question aside. Okay. So, Akash Krishna carried this idea forward to objects that actually share a boundary. So, the Objects in the lo lower left are two brain structures that are, one of them is the putamen and the other is the globus, globus pallidus, which are, except for a very thin layer of white matter, adjacent to each other. You'll notice, though, that with discreteness, there's some problems in finding exactly what you mean by that shared surface. Well, he did some toy problems where you see in the upper left that he had uh, basically two ellipsoids, one of which indented the other. And so you had uh, the outside, the one on the right was a proper ellipsoid and the other one had a, had a dent in it. And that dented region was the shared boundary region. Uh, and the basic point is that at, in that particular region, you have a linking surface is the shared region of the boundary. And in other parts where the objects are not adjacent, you have an ordinary linking surface. And the only problem with the, that idea that you have links of length zero, if you will, but you still have a linking surface, <coughs> is that you need the spokes of object one and of object two in that region to be collinear. You have to have the spoke. So now we have an object like so. We have another object. If I could draw it right, like so. And you have spokes here that need to line up with the spokes here for the basic idea of shape to work. And for that, you basically need normals to the boundary there to be the, to be the spoke dif uh, directions. But with that, the idea of Jurien know of linking surfaces extends uh, modulo the problem of dealing with how you make a smooth fit to the to get this surface of, of adjacency uh, that's work left to be continued The next problem, <coughs> so far we've talked about objects with a single, what I call, figure. From the Blum point of view, you heard Paul talk about branching skeletons. I personally am find, find the idea of Blum to describe the, shell, the skeletons in terms of branching to be uh, non-intuitive and, and providing only difficult obst obstacles to overcome about what happens at the branches. So we developed an alter some alternatives 
First of all, we had a dissertation by Robert Katz, Rob Katz, which is on the MyDAG website, where in, where in 2D he had the normal bushy skeleton, which he wanted to comp compile into figures and subfigures. So the general notion here is that when you have an object and you have a indentation in it, or you have an object and you have, a, sorry, you have a protrusion from it, or here you have an object with an indentation in it, that you want to separately describe this guy, the subfigure, or this guy, and this guy, and you want to have this understood as a host of this subfigure, or in this case, this is a host of this indentation subfigure, right? The indentation is sort of a subtractive kind of thing where the where the um, protrusion is an additive kind of thing. But the problem then is how you determine what's the host and what's the subfigure. And in 2D, that's not at all clear because if you have a Blum description, you have a situation where you have, for example, those three medial pieces. And then I'm drawing it poorly because I want this not to be, have the same, uh, in the Blum medial axis, the, these the directions are discontinuous at the branch, right? The tangent here and the tangent here are at some angle. The tangent here and the tangent here are at some, some non-180 degree angle, and so on for all three of them. But the, then the question arises, is this a this on this is the host? Or is it a this with this is the, protru the protrusion and this is the host? Or is it this and this, this is the subfigure? How do you decide? Right? So Rob Katz did a dissertation on, in 2D coming up with a method of how you do decide. How you decide which pieces hang together as host and which ones are subfigures. Okay? And you see an example of that with the I guess it's a salamander that you see in the left figure in the middle where he, ha you have uh, the legs that at least intuitively you want to be subfigures, but you also have all sorts of little bumps that you want to, if you want to consider them at all, you want them to be subfigures, but you want the main figure to be the, not the noisy part, if you will. So he took a human vision point of view. And our human visual system has the property that it, when I look at, let's say, Renee's face, uh, I may be interested, be interested in her whole face, her whole head, or I may be focusing on her lips, or I may be focusing on her eyes, or on her pupils, or on individual hairs. And the visual system compiles its information at multiple scales. That is to say, with multiple apertures that it averages over, essentially. And so in the visual system, in the early part of the visual system, you are simultaneously getting position information and, and scale, aperture size information over a range of apertures 
in a range of positions. And it turns out that the, the range of positions for any given aperture size is proportional to, so to, the, aperture, uh, to the aperture size. So I can't look at Renee's face, which requires an aperture size bigger than her head, and do it with a very small aperture, right? I can't, I can focus on her hair, all right? But then the aperture, then the little range of XYs that I'm looking at are going to be sort of multiples of hair size. Or if I have, if I'm going to be looking at the medium size feature, say her lips, then I'm going to be able to look at it with an aperture size that, I mean a range of positions that is proportional roughly to the size of her lips and so on. Okay, so the point is that this is a multi-scale arrangement that human vision works on. <laughs> and the skeletal theory, and indeed one that Christina Burbeck and I did some psychophysical experiments on indicate that the apertures that we are concerned with at any given place in the image are proportional to the skeletal width. Okay, that is to say as the, as the skeletal width, as the object gets th thicker, we look at it at bigger apertures. If you want to understand what the experiments we, we did to show that, it's in chapter one of the, the Siddiqui and Pizer Media book. But in any case, uh, given information at skeletally related scales, the idea is, is that continuation of direction of the skeleton is an important feature, right? So if something turns sharply at that scale, it is more likely to be a subfigure. Anyway, the other part, so, uh, so um, Katz came up with a notion of visual potential that integrates into, into saliency, which is to say how Im visually important things are, and which produces these results that you see uh, in the middle where the connection of things, uh, the saliency results say that the body of the of the salamander is all one thing, and the tail is a sub-thing of it, uh, and the, and the um, legs are sub-things of it. And there's also a way in which the sub-things, now that you have hosts and an idea of sub-things, the saliency of the sub-things adds to the saliency of the hosts. Anyway, it was an interesting ad hoc, but based on visual theory, multi-scale approaches, quite successfully put together things into hosts and subfigures. However, the method was never extended into 3D. Of course, we don't see the interior of things in 3D uh, because of the opacity of the boundaries. So it's not clear whether the visual model is right there, but it might, may well be. Okay, so the upshot is that that work focused on what I consider to be quite an important problem of, of determining what are main figures and what are sub-figures. Well, in 3D, we have Had back here. I 
had it on. There we go. Look at this jaw in the upper left. It's fairly clear that it's a sort of a U-shaped thing that goes that goes sort of around here, yeah? And on it are these protrusions and these other protrusions that are teeth. These guys are the processes that uh, where, whereby this uh, jaw, this mandible, attaches to the skull, right? It rotates here at the temporomandibular joint, TMJ. Uh, and th the natural way to want to handle that is as a sort of a U-shaped thing that has these protrusions on it and these various protrusions on it. And there's a main host figure and a bunch of subfigures. Same idea, right? Well, we have, I remind you, the conformalized mean curvature flow. And what happens in the conformalized mean curvature flow is that as you flow, this, the, the object, the, the, the host, if you will, smooths out. And rather quickly, the protrusion disappears. And so you end up with a, at some stage of the, some stage of the process. I should draw it here because this guy's being smoothed as well. But this guy disappears and its piece of skeleton disappears. Or put in the dilation, from the dilation point of view, by the time you get to this next situation, you have a simple skeleton. And if you play this backwards, at some point, each one of these protrusions begins to appear. And when they begin, the definition of when they begin to appear has to do with whether they get their own piece of skeleton. Okay, so the general idea then is that by this approach, you should be able to produce main figures and subfigures. Once you have that, you now need a shape description that says, okay, I have a piece of skeleton uh, for the subfigure and a piece of skeleton for the host figure, and they need to be attached in some skeletally consistent way. The work that was done in our group on that quite some years ago was done by Chong Han. Uh, Chung was a doctoral student here, later got his PhD here, later worked in shape analysis at the University of Kentucky, later after that entered medical school at the University of Kentucky, got an MD, and these days he's an MD radiologist and a PhD computer scientist. But in any case, his idea was that redraw this object. That you have an ordinary folded skeleton for this for this piece. And an ordinary folded skeleton 
for this piece. But on the top side of this fold, you want to take this piece and this piece and run them smoothly into each other. Okay, so now what happens is that the connection between the two pieces produces a funny kind of skeleton. It's a skeleton that doesn't have the two sides pasted together, right? You have this this piece here and this piece here that are smoothly attached into the skeleton here, but which are broken apart. And their spokes go like so. And you have this funny situation where you have nothing, no spoke going into the, this little sort of triangular region between them. OK, you can create a set of spokes if you want for them too to fill out this region on the other side of these two pieces of the <coughs> of the skeleton. In any case, the connection then in his work came from a decision on where to cut off this skeleton and how smooth how smoothly or you want to go from here to here. Do you want to go like so? Or do you want to come up to here? Or so on, right? Into the top side of the other guy's skeleton. In this, in this case, top side, the side where the protrusion is. Um, this was early work. There's still plenty to be done on it. But it ended up meaning that the, this blend region that you see corresponding to this connection here, now rotated around because it's a 3D object, uh, has its own statistics with a, with a rather small number of parameters describing the, connect, the connection. Essentially, what you have is the whole size here and the cutoff place here and everything else. Uh, and, and there's this. Uh, smoothness parameter, and it's quite efficient representation of the way things are connected. There's been, he did some, some statistics on that <coughs> with some reasonable effect. As far as I'm concerned, that remains an open question, how to deal with figures and subfigures. He also did the same, played the same game with regard to these subtractive guys. <coughs> OK, questions? There's some really interesting work going on by another doctoral student. I'm on his committee. I'm not his principal advisor. He's at the University of Stavanger, and his name is Mohsen Tahiri. Interesting. I find, find it interesting the way the world is these days. Mohsen has his dissertation advisor. He, he and his dissertation advisor are at, the, are at the University of Stavanger in Norway, but his dissertation advisor is himself German. Uh, his dissertation advisor's wife is Japanese. Uh, Mohsen is Iranian. Uh, and his other principal, sub, sub, co principal, or sub, sub principal advisor is me, an American. Uh, so that's an exciting, an exciting combination. Anyway, Mohsen. Uh, is began with the question that Jim Damon and I faced. Jim <coughs> more essentially than me. And the question is, what is the kind of object 
that is appropriate for skeletal analysis. And we call those slabular objects, objects that are in the form of slabs and have subfigures that are themselves slabs, and you can have sub subfigures and so on. Okay, and so my closed hand is a slab, and a slab is somehow a thing that has a long axis and a shorter axis and a yet shorter axis. So for my hand, the shorter axis goes from the top of my hand to the palm, the longer axis, the, the medium axis goes across my hand, and the long axis goes from the tip of one of the fingers back to the wrist. Okay, and once you ask that question more specifically, the idea is that there, you can describe the object as a sequence of cutting planes. You see, the, you see the example in the upper right, and that the cutting planes have the property, I mean obviously they're not parallel with each other, so they intersect. Successive planes intersect. But the idea is that the intersection has to be outside of the object. Okay, so you have a seek. So if you have a, you can find a sequence of cut planes where the uh, where the success, successive subplanes don't intersect inside the object, then you have a slabular object. Now, notice that once you have subplanes, in each plane you have the cross section of the object. Inside that, inside that, you have a 2D planar object. And that 2D planar object, on the assumption that this, these planes go along the longer axis of the object, the subplanes have cross sections that are sort of the medial, the medium length and the shorter length in the cross section, right? So one of the cross sections might be. If you had a long object like this, one of the cross sections might have some sort of a shape like that, and it it has a length and a width, if you will, that are smaller than that length. Okay? So, we have this notion then of an object being described by swept planes, and within each plane there is a 2D skeleton. That is to say, within each plane here, you have this folded skeleton within that plane, <coughs> which you can do ordinary spokes on in 2D. So you have spokes here and here and here and here and so on all the way all around. And all those spokes are coplanar. They're within that plane. Right? <coughs> And so are the skeletal points within that plane. <coughs> okay? We've described before the idea of a center point. It is simply if uh, for a 2D. 2D entity, it is sim simply the skeleton of the skeleton, right? It's a, a zero-dimensional thing, just as these individual 1, 1D skeletons in, within 2D are skeletons <coughs> of the 2D cross-section, just as these 2D cross sections uh, capture the interior of the whole object. But notice that the locus of the center points, 
through it well here, it would have gone through the center place. Forms an entity that we call the spine. Okay? And from this point of view, the object is what computer scientists call a generalized cylinder. A generalized cylinder has a curvilinear axis. Well, in this case, it's a folded cur curvilinear axis. It's a curvilinear, but it goes over here and then turns around and goes under itself like so. But it has a curvilinear axis. And at each point on the axis, there is a cross-section, typically orthogonal to the to the curve, but it doesn't have to be orthogonal. Uh, and <laughs> within each, you have a 1D skeleton with its spokes that are coplanar. So this handles a lot of things that are, you know, you first of all think of as tubular. You know, a tube is first of all like a pipe. Oh yeah, but a t pipe has the same radius everywhere. We can make the pipe bulge some places and be less uh, wide at other places. <laughs> Yeah, but you, go, you find your plumber today, they don't use lead pipes anymore, right? <laughs> or even metal pipes. They go and have these fiberglass pipes or whatever that, are, that have nice bend, that have bendability. So you can, if you go under your sink, you'll find not, if you have a modern sink, you won't find that kind of, the kind of pipe made out of metal, you'll find these things that curve. These are the these are generalized cylinders, okay. But we're going to generalize even further because our cross-sectional shape doesn't have to be circular. The first order, the simplest approximation would be that it be elliptical. And so, what we see in the lower right is an example of cross sections that are ellipses, ellipse ellipse shaped. And then we can be more general than that because we need, we can, it's okay for this ellipse to be bent a bit or to be, <coughs> have variable width as you move along the axis of the ellipse and so on. But they, now I've gen generalized and generalized, but I've got this, still this notion of an, a major axis and cross-sections and desc description of a skeletal description of within planes in those cross-sections. Well, we have this requirement that the cross-sections don't intersect inside the object. These planes, they do intersect, but they only allowed to intersect outside the object. And Jim Damon did a really nice piece of mathematics. And you can find his paper on, on, so, on so-called rel relative curvature criterion that says that if you look at the cross section, and you talk about, and you have the spine point, and you talk about R being <coughs> distance from the spine, that in order for the, and you let theta run around the spine point, for this to not cross, you have to satisfy the inequality in the bottom. Okay, so 
S is the position on the, the is the where you are along the spine. Uh, let's see. Sorry, that's not the case. Uh, S is the positional along the cross section. And you have R as a function of the, of the theta and, and, and that position. Uh, yeah. Uh, and if you satisfy, I, I've got a, a, a slight confusion here, but the basic, as you can see in, in the picture, you have in the cross section a, an angle from the normal and you have the distance from the spine and for things not to cross that condition has to hold. The main point here is that the, when you're creating the spine you need to satisfy that condition. For all the points around the object all the distances are from their spine center you need to be able to satisfy this, this equation. And if you do, you're guaranteed that, it, that, that there won't be a crossing inside the object. <clears throat> so Mosan is still working on his research. <laughs> uh, but the ultimate question is how, given a boundary, do you figure out what the spine is, and what the cross sections are, and that's what the skeleton is. But when you have done that and done it well, you now have the very nice property that a diffeomorphism from one jaw to another, for example, or for that matter, from an over on ellipsoid. And ellipsoids, after all, have a simple spine, straight spine, which is the uh, is the main axis of the medial ellipse of the ellipsoid. And its cross sections are all orthogonal to that. Right, so you have an ellipsoid. Can't draw a really good ellipsoid. And you have its spine like so, and all the cross sections are like so. And now the idea is since all the all the uh, the spokes I want to remind you that these cross sections are planes that come out of and behind the board. And so these planes have cross sections that have their own skeleton and their own spokes. And for every plane, the spokes are within the plane and the skeleton is within the plane. And then you have the beautiful possibility then of mapping essentially plane to plane to plane by this if your morphism met method from the from the ellipsoid that I talked about earlier. Well, in fact, Tahari's not doing it that way. I'm not going to get into how he's doing it. Um, I don't want to criticize it specifically before, you know, before he gets he has some nice principles of his own that he is trying to make things work so that you get correspondence across statistics. But the general point is if you can create this kind of a fit, then you should be able to produce really, really good correspondence across examples. And that's what gives you satisfactory statistics. <coughs> Questions? You remember I talked about fitted frames. <coughs> fitted frames now become really pretty straightforward, right? In a plane, every place on the, within that frame has 
a the, the normal to that plane as its as one of its frame elements, and the other two frame elements are <coughs> defined by what goes on in the cross section. And I remind you that you have to handle the situation shown here where the skeleton twists. So if, if you think about there being a cross section that's elliptical, as you walk along the spine, that ellipse may rotate about the spine within it, from plane to plane. And so this twist property is an important shape property that needs to be represented if you're going to be doing decent shape analysis. Anyway, the point is that you end up with an ability to produce rather straightforward fitted planes, fitted frames. And from those fitted frames, you can get a variety of shape statistics. And he talks about the spoke lengths, the spoke directions, the, the connections between one skeletal point and the next, which are, of course, written in terms of their own fitted frame. The connection directions, those little pieces here, between here and here is, is a vector, and that vector has a direction that is written in a coordinate system of its tail's frame, or possibly its center point's frame. And he ends up, and the frames themselves produce values. And then he is doing, he, Mohsen is in a department of statistics, and he's doing hypothesis tests on those as a measure of how successful this idea of swept Spain SREPs is. I'm pretty well taken by it, although the method of fitting still needs work, fitting to a boundary. The final problem is this, when you run a diffeomorphism between something that looks like this and something that looks like that, <coughs> what you want to get is a skeleton that bends smoothly from here to here, and that doesn't on the, on the way do something like that, that does any, that some, has some kind of self-intersection. <coughs> and to do that, you need to understand the space of possible diff diffeomorphisms to keep, keep this non-crossing criterion, or alternatively, you have a constrained space in which the set of skeletons that, that has to stay in as you move through. And he's worked out exactly such a thing. <coughs> to allow this initial skeleton, for example, to evolve through a variety of skeletons and eventually end up being this twisted skeleton. OK, so keep your eye on this work. I think it's going to be very interesting. He's working on a paper right now describing this approach. Questions? Okay, so you've got one of these generalized cylinders. These generalized cylinders 
uh, has a spine that's curving. We have this problem where we're, try we're trying to deal with colons, large intestines. Here's one in the upper left of this side, this left figure. And it has, you know, a, a slightly curved section, but not that curved, and then a sharp turn, and then has, this guy has a bit of curvature, and then a sharp turn, and this guy has, this part has a uh, moderate curvature and so on. The upshot is you have this curved thing, and we at the time decided we wanted to figure out how to display a colon in a way that you could look at its inside. So our idea was, well, if we straightened it out, we'd be able to slit it along one of the sides, and then we could roll it open, and we could look at it from the inside. But to do that, you needed straightening. But there are lots of other reasons you might want to do straightening. Okay? Um, in work that Sherry is involved with, we have objects inside, on the inside wall of this generalized cylinder that are growths, that are polyps that need to be discovered and removed. Okay, and so you need to be able to find them and you need to be able to find them even in parts of the colon that are heavily bent, heavily curved. So, Rabin Ma set to figure out how to do a good straightening of a generalized cylinder using these skeletal sort of ideas. His paper on that <coughs> was published, both added proceedings of a conference, Pacific Graphics Conference, conference and, and in a journal. It's on, and it's on the MIDAG website, collection of papers. Also appears in his dissertation as one of the chapters in his dissertation, which can be found there. And his basic idea was, first of all, find some reasonable skeleton. In the terms I've been using now, we're talking about a reasonable spine, a curvilinear skeleton. Find a spine. Doesn't have to be perfect. But what he wanted, first of all, was to have his spine satisfy Damon's relative curvature condition. So all its orthogonal cross-sections, right? So I'm talking about a curve in space, in free space, and every place in free space you have a plane orthogonal to the curve. In other words, that it's, that plane every, is, uh, has its axes, orthogonal to the tangent to the curve there, and that these planes didn't self-intersect. That is to say, they satisfied the relative curvature condition of Damon. But, so you can check the relative curvature condition and it fails some places, meaning the planes cross inside the object. So he said, well, we can just shift the curve, modify the spine. And he found a way to modify the spine so that almost everywhere, let me just shift the spine from where it is to something different. You know, you might take this piece and 
sort of straighten it out a bit, tripped it. So as with the new spine, it the relative curvature condition was satisfied. And for places where it was not satisfied, but typically only off by a bit, he could solve the problem by not using an orthogonal cross section. So the cross section just needed to, the cross sections needed to tip a little bit relative to orthogonality, and he could record the tipping. Right? So instead of being purely orthogonal, they might tip like so, and when they did, they didn't self intersect. The upshot is by this first stage, he produced something that had a, was a spine with cross sections, consistent with the, the Damon idea of swept, swept uh, cross sections. And we now can try to straighten the spine. Okay, so now we're going to straighten the object. But as you straighten the spine, you can see from the second stage to the, the, the B stage on the upper figure to the C stage, you want the relationship between the cross sections, cross sectional shapes to rotate as little as possible from their relation when the thing was curved. I'm talking about now rotating about, about the spine. And so he indeed had a stage where you now had each one of these cross sections, but now about the spine. And which wasn't, had the same shape as it had before, but now in a cross section to the desired axis. And once he said that, he didn't have to just straighten. He said, well, well I want to have a, you know, the colon shape to be this slightly curving thing in the upper right of the left figure this guy here, and I could do that. I could just make the cross sections all, make the spine modification, not the go to space straight, but go to this desired curve. And you can play this same game, so in these blocks where I want to, I want to make this map onto that, or I want to, I want to uh, map onto a, a sharply curved thing. Okay, so the point is the target shape was supposed to, we originally decided that we wanted to go straight, to go into a straight axis, but the method generalizes. The final part of the story, uh, once you've got these rotation minimizing things along the desired spine shape, is you need to be able to interpolate densely what goes on between these <coughs> sampled cross sections. Uh, and basically he treated this as a bending energy minimization problem <coughs> where you wanted to get the least bending between one of these cross sections and the next. And that and that's a problem that is solved by an appropriate bending energy method. Thin plates flying that I told, talked to you about is one possibility. There are some others. Okay. But the main point here is now you have straightening. And you can use geometric features of the straightening to describe the shape. Or 
Or alternatively, you can do things on the straightened shape, find polyps, for example, find in our application what we call blind spots, parts of the surface that were never surveyed by the object and reconstructed as a whole in this thing. And it's easy to figure out what the holes are on a straightened object, harder on a curved object. But you now know the geometric transformation between A and D. And so once you find this polyp, you can map it back onto the, you can reverse the, 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 the deformation and map it back onto the curved axis where it originally lived. Okay, questions? So, <laughs> the bending energy that he used was basically the Laplacian. Let me remind you that a Laplacian is a sum of all the second derivatives. And so if you have <laughs> a function of two variables, f of x, y, you have d, d2f by dx squared, d2f by dy squared, d2f by dx by dy, and d2f by dy by dx. There are four of them. And in the case of, uh, okay, but the Laplacian is the sum of the unmixed ones. So in three dimensions, it's simply d2f by dx squared plus df, d2f by dy squared plus d, d2f by dz squared. Okay, it's the sum of, and this is a very nice rotation uh, isotropic op operator that, me that measures bending because the second derivatives are how it thinks of bending. But we have curved surfaces, right? So we have curvatures that don't live in a Euclidean space. And so we have to take our bending, our second derivatives on the manifold, on, on the curving manifold. And doing a Laplacian on the curving manifold goes under the name of Laplace Beltrami operator. And the Laplace Beltrami operator uh, was already referred to in Paul Yushkevich's uh, <coughs> lecture. In any case, once you have that, you have <coughs> overall places on your On your uh, object, you have an ability to talk about the bending of the object from one cross-section to the next. And he used what is called the thin shell bending energy. Thin shell means you're essentially treating the surface as the boundary as a little thickened, right? It's, it's, it becomes a very narrowly thickened version of itself. And then you do standard mechanical energy things that involve the Laplace Beltrami operator on that so as to produce these curvatures. Okay, so the upshot is he had a way to go from C to D by minimizing bending energy. I have one more piece of work to talk to you about based on skeletal models here at UNC. And it's the work of Jessica Crouch. Well, Jessica arrived here 
as Jessica Crawford, <clears throat> but she already knew she was going to be marrying Eric Crouch. And I thought she was very, very clever to pick a login JRC that would work either way. Okay, so, but in any case, I believe all of her publications went, were done under the name Crouch. Her dissertation is on the MyDeg website, so was pa paper she published on it. And she was concerned with finite element models, mechanical models, whereby if you put forces on an object, the object would change shape. And these finite element models in 3D divide the, clo the closure of the interior of the object into finite elements of a fixed shape and typically on as tetrahedron. So remind you, a tetrahedron is something with four triangular sides or they can be something with a quadrilateral as one of its sides, a planar thing that produces a kind of pyramid that has triangular sides. And once you have that, there's a bunch of differential equations that you can solve by putting forces on some of these faces, typically on the outside, and the adjacent faces put forces on each other <laughs> and you end up with the solution that says here's how these forces are going to change the shape. And the trick is fitting the object with these finite elements entities. And Jessica said, well, let's do it skeletally. Right? So if we had a skeleton, that was divided into quadrilaterals somehow. Could be triangles, but anyway. And the spokes come out to the boundary on the top side. You end up with these, if it, if it was quadrilateral, these uh, pseudo parallel pipe beds, if you will. Uh, which you can divide into triangles. Or alternatively, if you sample this skeleton it's itself into triangles, you can, you can produce tetrahedral elements. Either way, once you have that, you can run your equation. But the problem is, two things. First of all, you need to be able to do this not just on objects with a simple skeleton, like you see here. This structure on the left is a particular pelvic structure. Um, but also with objects that have protrusions. And the problem is that you really want to do that with really small elements. It's the individual finite elements to get this thing to work accurately you want to be small. And the problem becomes very, the solution problem becomes very big. 
And so I'm running out of time. I'm going to give you the general result. <coughs> and I'll finish up next time with a bit more detail. But the basic, her basic idea was that once you have these elements described with medial spokes, you can, you know how to do spoke interpolation. And you know how to um, subdivide the spokes by radial distance, right? You can subdivide the spokes by half. And, when you, and what she said was, start with a very coarse finite model, which you can solve for fast. That produces a deformation which you can apply to everything. And now, subdivide, the, subdivide these things skeletally. And resolve. But now, your optimization is not going to have to go very far because you have a pretty good approximation. And, when you do, and you play that game in a multi-scale fashion, a course to find fashion, and she found a good result. The other part of the story was she had a, found a way to figure out how to take the skeletal description of a protrusion and a skeletal of a host and to make, to make all these things at the bottom of this thing match how it's subdivided on the top of each other, because all the faces have to match exactly to each other in a skeletal model. I'll say that a little again at the end of last time, next time, but that's the basic idea. So to close, this is, I think, the last slide of the se section on shape representation. And we're now going to move into a part of the course that's on shape statistics. We will start by Tom Fletcher's lecture that says, I want to do the statistics directly on the shape space manifold. Right? We're talking about shape spaces. The shape spaces themselves are curved. We talked about, for example, that a shape space for directions is a sphere, a set of directions is a polysphere. Those are manifolds. We want to be able to do. Every instance is a point on that manifold, and now I want to be able to do statistics on that. And he's going to talk about how to think about doing that. And then I'll come back and talk about a whole variety of shape statistics methods, both on, man on the manifolds or via Euclidianization, doing it on flat spaces after you do Euclidianization. OK, till next time. Questions? Wish there were more questions, but there's only two of you here, and I haven't done know how many people were out there, and I can only see you at the moment. I think you had about eight at one time, there were but eight. it was two, two of us, so it's probably about an additional six or seven.